So you've heard all about the FIRE movement or financial independence retire early, and you're chomping at the bit to get out of the rat race as soon as possible. But hang on just a second. What's a safe withdrawal rate from your investment portfolio when that money has to last 50 or 60 years? Is the 4% rule going to be good enough for you in retirement? Today on Your Money, Your Wealth, Karsten Yeska, PhD, CFA, a.k.a. Big Earn from EarlyRetirementNow.com, shares his experiences. Plus, join Big L, answer your emails and money questions from the Y. MYW podcast survey that closed last week. Will listener Paul reach $5 million by retirement and will he do it in a Ford Taurus? Can monthly payments from an IRA annuity be used for qualified charitable distributions or QCDs? And what happens if you've made mistakes with your IRA that lead to penalties? I'm producer Andy Last, and here with our guest, Karsten Bigger and Yeska, are the hosts of Your Money, Your Wealth, Joe Anderson, CFP, and Big Al Clopine, CPA. Karsten Yeska. Yes. yes. Is it Yeska or yes. Yeski? Yeska. I, Karsten, I, I, help us out here. Karsten Yeska. 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 Oh, so yeah, I killed it. <laughs> but I've heard everything. I've, so, I've heard everything from <laughs> Jeska to Jetski. Jetski. Jet jet ski, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I'm Clopine. I've been called Clothespin. Clopine, <laughs> Cloping with a G. I've called all kinds of stuff. Joe Anderson's got it pretty easy. Yeah, I do. <laughs> so, Big Earn, they call you. Tell us about why they call you Big Earn. Well, initially, I blogged anonymously, and well, my blog is called Early Retirement Now, so Earn. People called me Earn, and then Big Earn, and the name just stuck, and I'm a big guy, so I'm 6'6 six, six tall, so I really like that nickname, and I just kept it. So did they call you, like, Big Karsten prior to Big Earn? No, 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 never did it that. Doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't roll as well. It doesn't really time. roll as Big yeah. Earn. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you retired in 2018 at the age of 44. That's right. So tell us about your journey, my friend. So I came to the U.S. in 1995. I was 21 years old. I came here for grad school, got my first job here in 2000 at the Federal Reserve, uh, and then switched over to the private sector in 2008, uh, right at the, pretty much at the wrong time, right? So right around the time when you had the global financial crisis, lots of job cuts. And around that time, I got a new job at a big asset manager. So I was always planning to do a little bit earlier retirement than normal, but then you see job cuts everywhere in 2008. Uh, pretty much every year since 2008, you see there's, there's always some restructuring, job cuts. So you always have this concern that when does it hit me? So I always had a relatively high savings rate. Uh, so and then after 10 years of having a savings rate of probably around 50 to 60%, while I was working in the private sector, I thought, well, there's no more need to work any longer. I, mean, if I have enough money to have a pretty nice annual budget in early retirement and a budget that will hopefully last for 50 to 60 years because my wife was 35 when, when we both retired. So on my side, it's probably about a 50-year horizon. On my wife's side, a 60-year horizon. So I, I did the math and it just came out that uh, I would be crazy to keep working. Hey, where are you from originally? Uh, I'm from Germany originally. So and so, up there. what's the average savings rate in Germany? Because right. I know the U.S. is relatively low to a lot right. of European countries. Right. So, uh, it's definitely higher than in the U.S. It's probably somewhere around 20% or so. But then Germans are also really bad with where they put the money, right? The bulk of savings are in, say, savings accounts and whole life insurance contracts. So I basically combined the best of both worlds, right? A high savings rate and then also the courage to invest your savings in something more productive. So especially stocks and real estate. That's what I did. So Big Earn and I are the same age. Yes. And you're still working. I know. And I do this for a living. (laughs) (laughs) What's up with that? Jesus. Well, Well, maybe maybe you like it. It's like I'm an obese trainer. Maybe you just like working. Yes, love it. <laughs> I love coming to see you. Love with you love talking with me yes. every week. So, all right. Well, walk me through because we've interviewed quite a few people on the fire movement, uh, which I find fascinating. But I think some of the individuals that we've interviewed are going to crash and burn, and I'm not going to say any names. And I think some of them are going to be very successful throughout their overall, you know, I guess early retirement or fire retirement. You look at a sustainable distribution rate, and at 44, you can't be taking 4% out of the overall portfolio. No, I'm not. So so what are some of the things that you're looking at to make sure that your money's going to last you the next 50, 60 years? 
Right. So, I mean, I'm doing um, basically what everybody's doing, whether it's a traditional retirement or early retirement. I'm, I'm looking at historical uh, returns and look at what would have been the fail safe withdrawal rates, even at the worst points in time in history, right? And the worst time in history to retire would be either 1929, right before the global financial uh, meltdown back then, or in the mid 1960s, uh, where you had pretty flat returns for about eight, nine years, then the 1973, 74, five recession hit, then more recessions in 1980 and 81, 82. So even if you had retired at these worst possible times in history, and you have a portfolio of somewhere around 60, 40, maybe 70, 30, even 80, 20, you would have lasted 50 to 60 years in retirement withdrawing that initial, say, 3.2%, the withdrawal amount, and then adjusting that for inflation. That would have lasted you 50 to 60 years. So it's amazing how just reducing your withdrawal amount from 4% to maybe into the low 3%, that would have lasted for a lot longer than the 4% rule. How did you come up with the 3.2% rate? Because, I mean, that's what everyone <laughs> hears is the 4% is the safe withdrawal rate, which, by the way, was designed for a 65-year-old and maybe right. to last about 25 years. But at age 44, obviously, you have to come up with a different number. How did you figure out it was 32 Oh, no, I mean, I, I have my own calculations. And so I have a spreadsheet that I can use to do these historical simulations. And then, I mean, you can obviously personalize that, right? So you can um, target your personal preferences, your, your personal asset allocation. Uh, you can also factor in what kind of additional cash flows you may have, and they could be positive or negative, right? So for example, in, in my case, I'm still getting a little bit of deferred compensation from my old job. So that's going to knock about a percentage point or so off my withdrawals right now for the first three years in retirement. Then I'm going to get a small pension at age 55. I'm going to claim Social Security at age 70. So my wife and I, we're going to do that Social Security hacking where the higher earner uh, waits until age 70 and then she will claim it at 62. So there are these additional cash flows on the positive side. There's obviously also a little bit of additional cost as we get older. Uh, we should take into account that we probably have some higher health expenditures when we get older. So factoring all these additional expenses and incomes, I have a way of exactly pinning down what would have been the exact amount you could have withdrawn from your portfolio if you had retired in, say, September 1929. So I do that for every possible starting month in history. But of course, the fail-safe retirement dates and the fail-safe uh, retirement safe withdrawal rates, they would occur somewhere around uh, 1929 and 1965, 66. Hey, so Big Aaron, uh, another common theme we get with people that come on this show that are in the FIRE movement, they write a blog. Mm -hmm. And then some of these individuals ended up making more money on their right. blog writing than they did when they were working. Yeah, or, or as much, right? <laughs> or as much. <laughs> yeah. So are you kind of in that camp? No, not at all. At least not now. Um, <laughs> if, if that ever happens, it would be nice. Even though I see that there's a certain irony there, right? So right. I'm trying to educate people about safe withdrawal rates. And then through this irony, I actually, I don't need to factor any safe withdrawal rates myself anymore because now I'm bringing in the big bucks from the from the blog, which right now I'm not. I'm, I'm making a few hundred dollars a month from some advertising income. Oh, okay. and, well, not uh, after this show. Yeah, <laughs> not after, oh, I was, trust me. I was going to say that's twice as much. That's a hundred times more yeah. than us. Yeah, we yeah, we should uh, actually point out the fact that uh, Big Earn has done a great deal of research on this, and it is all available on his blog at Early Retirement. Now, you've actually got a working paper on this, don't you? Yeah, so I, I published a working paper. It's uh, it's it's out on my on my blog. If you look at the top of the page, there is a menu item, safe withdrawal rate series. I've written dozens of blog posts on this entire yeah, aren't topic. Yeah, you up to like 32 now or something? Uh, I think uh, 31. <laughs> I'm, I'm working on 32. It should be coming out soon, yeah. Yep. yeah. So you're working at this asset manager, and right. then so you started blogging. And then it was just earn at that point. You didn't want to exactly. say your name exactly. because you didn't want the big money manager to find out that big earn is really looking to punch. 
<laughs> right, right. You don't want to do that. So in, in 2016, I started with a blog and I still had one promotion that I was eyeing and uh, get a nicer office for the last two years in the office. Yeah. So I got that promotion in late 2016. And then in 2018, I, I had enough and retired. Yeah. So, all right. Re retiring at 45, 44. What does the day to day look like? Because right. we work with retirees that are 65 and then all of a sudden at age 70, they're bored, they're miserable, they're depressed, they lost a sense of purpose, identity, and things like that because, you know, you, you get kind of stuck in this routine. But with you at 44, I mean, that's a long time of right. retirement. So what, right. what are you, what you going to do? to Besides the blog, I guess, what's the day-to-day -day look like in Big Earn's life? Right. So the last 14 months, we traveled 11 months. And so we just returned from another trip this summer. So last year, we were on the road for seven months. Then we came home as basically we didn't have a home for seven months. We bought a house while we were traveling, made an offer on a house while we were traveling. The transaction closed while we were in Australia. And then friends of us picked up the keys and looked after the house for us until we came back from the trip in late December last year. So then we moved into our house first few months in the house, we had to do a few home renovations. So that keeps you busy. And uh, so then in April, we left again and just came back in August this month. And so right now, I'm definitely not bored, right? So this is actually going on vacation for so long. And first of all, planning it all, uh, and then doing it all and going from place to place, country to country, doing sightseeing, uh, it almost feels like a job. I mean, it's, it feels so much like a feels so much like a job. You almost have to take a vacation from your vacation every once in a while, right? So after five days of sightseeing, you have to take one or two days off and just goof off. And uh, uh, so we have a we have a little daughter. She's five years old. So if we just goof off, we'll just go to some park or playground and. Uh, I just read something. I work on my blog. So, yeah, I mean, you're right that uh, a lot of people in retirement, they face this issue of boredom. Uh, I haven't felt it yet, uh, even though, I mean, now we are back in our permanent location. Uh, our daughter will start kindergarten in a few weeks. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about could this happen to me that I'll be bored? I hope not because I have my blog. Uh, I might do some other side projects. I want to get back into teaching again doing a little bit of teaching on the side. Again, this is not going to be a job that I need in terms of the income because I did my safe withdrawal analysis under the assumption that I've got no additional income from the blogging or teaching or anything. Uh, so this is just going to be for fun and uh, for staying active. If you love hearing stories from the fire movement like Big Earns, click the link in the description for this episode in your podcast app and go straight to the show notes to read the transcript of this interview and to listen to previous fire episodes. Get more early retirement inspiration from Tanya Hester. She retired before the age of 40. Listen to her in YMYW episode 211. Grant Sabatier, you may remember him. He saved a million bucks in five years and told us all about it in episodes 134 and 207. Jamilo Souffrant talked about saving $85,000 per year in episode 162. And for ideas on making more money to reach fire, listen to YMYW episode number 165 for 250 plus side hustles from Nick Loper. Links to all of these episodes are in the show notes for today's episode at yourmoneyyourwealth.com. So a couple of things come to mind when I hear this. Big Earn made a big ass paycheck and right. was and, able to save a, bunch, a of bunch of money. Right. That's right. That's right. You know, so it's not like an average Joe here where it's like he's working for a big money manager, probably made a ton of money, was able to save right. 40, 50 percent of it. So at 44, you know, you look, you got, you know, a bunch of zeros behind this thing. That's pretty cool that you can do all of these other travel activities because that's not cheap. Australia's not. I've never been. I haven't really been outside of my little bubble, <laughs> but I hear that Australia is not cheap in traveling in everything else with with a child and wife. So what advice do you think you could give someone that didn't have a very large paycheck to still achieve the fire or independence at an early age, like myself? 
Right. So, I mean, first of all, yeah, you're right. I had a big paycheck. But then again, I was the only person working full time. So my wife was just doing some hourly jobs, maybe a few hours, maybe five to 10 hours a week through a temp agency. She's a nurse. So I was the only one with a high income. So I had the advantage of having a high income, but I, we had the disadvantage of having only one income, right? And we had the disadvantage of living in a very high cost of living area like San Francisco. So, I mean, you hear obviously a lot of people claiming that I could never do anything like the people in the fire movement because you have to be married, you have to both have uh, high incomes, you have to have no kids, you can't live in a high cost of living area. And uh, yeah, I mean, sure, I checked some of these boxes and I didn't check some of the other boxes. So, so unless you're really in the worst possible scenario where in every single category you're unlucky right i mean you're the you don't make much income you're the only earner you have five kids you live in new york city then it might become difficult but i think everybody is going to have some ways how they can increase their savings rate right and i don't know how you want to do it if you want to do it the, the same way as grant who has been on your on your podcast a few times uh, or if you want to do it more cold turkey you you just slash your expenses and just to get it over with i mean there, there are definitely a lot of ways how you can cut your expenses i mean especially in the three big categories like car housing and food there's a lot of information out there in the fire community uh, where people share recommendations how to cut costs in these three categories. Say for housing, what a lot of people do is they buy a multifamily property, a duplex, triplex, uh, quadruplex. Uh, they stay in one unit themselves. They rent out the other units. They get the tax benefit. Well, they used to get the tax benefits. Now it's going to be a little bit more difficult. Uh, yeah, so housing uh, you can do this this approach. It's called house hacking, where you you rent out part of your primary residence. So I mean, there there are ways, and um, I don't want people to think that the only way you can reach fire is if you're exactly like I, because nobody will be exactly like that. And probably there was also a little bit of better timing, right? I was lucky that I had this long bull market run over the last ten years. And uh, well, if the people who are looking into this and they are a little bit less lucky and it takes them 15 years instead of 10 years, I think that's still an extremely good performance. And, and also don't forget, so in my personal situation, I also went to school relatively long, right? It took me until age 26 to finish grad school. There are also some people, they already make good money at age 21, whereas I was pretty much at a zero net worth, maybe slightly positive net worth until age 26. So everybody has their little advantages and disadvantages. So I don't, I don't want people to believe that they can do it because they don't have my income. But you were saving 60% of it. Is that after taxes or is that gross? Is that yes. No, no. I mean, this is from the net income, right? And then there's even a little bit of, it's a little bit of cheating, right? Because you, you save something pre-tax, and you still include that. You, you split your, your total compensation into taxes, savings, and consumption. And then when you calculate your savings rate, you add your savings plus your consumption. And then you look at what percentage of that sum is my savings. And th this, that's how I got 50 to 60%. Because you, you, you have a hard time getting a 60% savings rate if you pay 30% taxes, right? So it, it has yeah. to be off of some kind of a net figure. Because if you don't do that, then it becomes really difficult comparing by different income groups. I mean, 60%, again, it's because I made very good money, but we never felt that we were depriving ourselves. We led a relatively comfortable upper middle class life in San Francisco. We didn't really go out much to restaurants and bars. My wife likes to cook at home. I like to eat what my wife cooks. Uh, instead of going out to restaurants, say imagine we had we had friends in town. So instead of going out to restaurants and spending $100 a person per meal, uh, we'd rather do something at home where you spend only a fraction of that, right? So, I mean, a good indicator for us, for example, was that when I retired and I told people at the office what I had done in terms of this was my savings rate and this is how much, I didn't tell them how much money we have, but kind of give them a ballpark. Uh, people were really surprised. And so, so that's a good sign. So they didn't consider me a penny pincher uh, while I worked there. I did that really pretty much under the radar and nobody noticed what, what we were doing, which is a good sign. And that also means that it wasn't really too much of a sacrifice for us. Uh, one last question, Big Aaron. Can you give me an idea of what the makeup, not specifics, yeah. but maybe asset allocation 
Right. Uh, why is it what your portfolio consists of, of stocks, bonds, real estate? Uh, yeah, so right now we have about 55% equities. So that's mostly index funds, both US and international. And then about 35% of the portfolio, I do some option trading. I do put selling, so vol selling to collect the premium from put options. Uh, so I do that on S&P 500 index puts. And then another 10% is in real estate. And that's uh, through private equity funds. So that's very hands off for me. I don't have to manage anything. That's It's a fund that manages that for me. Uh, but then obviously the option trading, I do that multiple times a week. So I do the very short term, very short to expiration puts that I sell. That's very profitable. And we can almost live off of just that 35% of the total net worth that's in that option trading uh, strategy. And we can almost leave the rest of the, the portfolio untouched right now. That's awesome. Um, yeah. So the website is earlyretirementnow.com, early retirement now. Yeah, that's right. What's the latest blog? What do you got cooking? Well, I just recently wrote a summary of everything I've written on the safe withdrawal rate series. Uh, so my blog and then also the series is is nominated for a Plutus Award. That's kind of our fire blogging Oscars, basically. You may know about the Trinity study, but uh, if you want to read up on what you want to do in early retirement, uh, nobody wants to read 31 posts on safe withdrawal rates, each about probably two to 3,000 words. It's too intimidating and uh, off-putting. So I wrote a, a nice summary of that. Uh, so people who are interested in that, they read the summary and then maybe they find something that, that interests them in particular and then read up more on that. So that was the, that was the most recent post. And then I'm, I'm working on a, on a bunch of different posts. I'm trying to write one where I want to compare what is the difference between me and a pension fund, right? And because we are essentially a pension fund with two beneficiaries, right? Uh, so what are the challenges that pension funds have and how is my problem as a two-person pension fund actually slightly more complicated than even that of a, of a real pension fund, right? Like a corporate or public pension fund. So it's just making the case that the withdrawal math is quite a bit more complicated than accumulating as everybody can accumulate as all you have to do is save money automate your savings uh, the money grows over time you put more money in you don't have to worry too much about uh, say a, a bear market in the short term it's actually almost optimal to invest through the bear market and do the dollar cost averaging but the withdrawal math it's a lot more complicated right now you are very very worried about short-term losses because you would start withdrawing money when prices are down. So it's basically the, what I try to convey there is the withdrawal of your assets is a lot more complicated than accumulating assets. And then the running this pension fund with one beneficiary or two beneficiaries is actually more complicated than, at least in certain dimensions, than running a, a corporate pension fund. And that's already pretty complicated, right? They have to hire very highly skilled, highly trained people to do that. And my problem is even more complicated than that. So it's, it's definitely you want to read up a little bit, especially if you're in the fire movement, right? You invest so much time over the over the next 10, 15 years to accumulate assets. Uh, maybe you want to invest a little bit of time also learning about how to withdraw them uh, without running out of money. And uh, so come to my blog and and read up on that. By far the smartest Fire movement dude ever. Fire movement <laughs> dude. I, there you go, baby. I would, I would agree with that. Financial independence, retire early. Yeah, he's a PhD. He's a doctor in this. I CFA. Know. CFA. That's, he's got a name yeah. big. Put us to shame. <laughs> this guy's awesome. Earlyretirementnow.com. Check it out. Learn a bunch. Big Earn, hey, thank you so much for your time and congratulations on all your success at such a young, early age. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. If you've got questions about reaching financial independence or early retirement, or any money question for that matter, go to yourmoneyyourwealth.com, scroll down and click Ask Joe and Al on air and send it in as a voice message or an email. Many of you filled out the podcast survey and sent in questions along with, which the fellows will answer over the coming weeks. So if you don't hear the answer to your question today, it will be covered in a future episode, I promise. So keep listening. Now let's get to those questions. Paul from South Carolina writes in a novel... It's just like, I got to charge you for this, Paul. <sighs> All right, here we go. Well, how much time do I got? As much gonna... as you want. We could do it over two segments. All right. I really enjoy your podcast. Hey, thanks, Paul. 
I just started listening about a week ago, uh, but I'm catching up from 2018 until today. Jesus, Paul, <laughs> good life. My wife and I wow. have the goal of a $5 million net worth when we, re, when we retire. Uh, can we do it and how long should it take? Background info, I'm 51, my wife's 48, our annual gross household income is $120,000, we are debt free. He's got a home worth about six fifty, paid off. He's got a uh, dumpy ass double wide, <laughs> about forty k. He used a different word. Yeah, we, there's a hole. Yeah, and there's something <laughs> in something, front of it. Something hole. Yeah. It, okay. Uh, he's got a four hundred one k, four hundred. Wife's four hundred one k is a hundred. Uh, Roth IRA sixteen thousand. Wife's Roth IRA is fourteen thousand. Got a little Vanguard cash brokerage fourteen. Uh, double E bonds of forty eight thousand, one point three million dollars. All right, got some work to do, Paulie, but uh, so far so good. Okay, you just recently inherited three annuities uh, that we would like advice on, and where to put these funds to reach our five million dollar goal. The first annuity from Modern Woodman is worth six hundred thirty six thousand dollars. Is that right? Fifty six thousand yep. is taxable. All right. The other two annuities from Lincoln Benefit were already annuitized prior to us inheriting them. The monthly payments for each of them is three thousand and sixteen hundred, so forty five hundred bucks. Let's just round okay. of annuity payments that he is receiving. The payments will continue until December twenty twenty six. All right, so he's got about seven years there. After twenty twenty, the payments will no longer be taxable. How should we invest the proceeds of these three annuities? You want to start there, bud? <laughs> Because he's got a whole nother page. <laughs> I know. Yeah, I'll start because I, I added a couple of numbers together and did a couple calculations. All right, good. So I, I took a look at, uh, Paul, your 401k, your wife's 401k, Roth IRA, your wife's uh, Roth IRA. The liquid assets, I get 592000 Okay, so that's uh, starting point. And then I'm, I just took the, the one uh, annuity that we know what the value is, 636000 so I said, well, if you surrender that, yeah, you got to pay taxes on 56000 of it, but I'm not worried about taxes. Now I'm just doing just a quick calculation. So I, I, I add the annuity, 636 to the liquid assets of about 600000 I get a million two twenty eight. So that's the starting point. Then I said, all right, so Paul's 51 years old. Let's just say he wants to retire at full retirement age, which would be 67. So I don't know if that's true or not, but I'm just making that assumption. So that's 16 years from now. And then I just very simply said, well, between you and your wife, you're saving at least $50,000 into 401ks and Roth IRAs. I just used 50. Okay. And I used a 7% rate of return um, because it looks like he's all in the stock market, So, um, which we'll, we'll get to in a second. But I just used a 7% rate of return. 16 years, starting with $1.2 million, adding 50000 a year. You end up with $5.1 million. Boom. There you go. Paul. All done. Killed it. But he wants to retire early. He didn't want to work till sixty-seven. He listens to your money or wealth, and now he's going to listen to big ass earn. Tell him he should, re- <laughs> should should retire at fifty-four. That's right. All right. Okay. So if he just did the the max out four hundred one k plans, what he's currently got, get seven percent. Bada yeah. boom. It gets to five million. All right. So let's read on. So we also fund our 401ks annually, $25,000 for me, $19,000 for my wife, which will increase to $25,000 the year she turns 50. All right, so Big Al already calculated that. Uh, this year we, excuse me, well, uh, this year we funded our 401ks. <laughs> what? I'm, I'm drinking fluids and sometimes I get excited. Put that Coors Light away, Joe. Hey, don't worry about it. Uh, this year we funded our 401k pre-tax to lower adjusted gross income, but both uh, we'll be funding Roth IRAs for 2020. Uh, we also funded our Roth IRAs each year: seven thousand for me, five thousand for my wife. Six thousand. Six thousand. Sorry, we will continue to fully funding the 401ks and Roth IRAs until we retire. So, Al, got to add in another. I know. Thirteen thousand bucks. You're right, but I was just going conservative. I mean, just on the surface, and and then it's like part of the question is well. By doing this and maybe tweaking a few other things, when can I retire? And so that's an, I didn't do that calculation, but that's something that uh, he, Paul would probably like to know. All right. Our investment blend in the different accounts is pretty similar. No bond exposure in 49% S&P 500, 70% small cap index, 17 in mid cap index, and 17 in international index. The only variance in the Roth accounts have actively managed funds, but similar asset class blend. 
One final separate but related question. Should I buy a new car? All right. My current vehicle is high mileage 2002 Ford Taurus. Oh, chicks dig 2002 <laughs> Ford Taurus. You know from experience? I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> my, my wife drives a 2015 Honda Odyssey. So Paul, he's driving the, the Ford Taurus, and then she gets she's a got 2015 the, she's Odyssey. She's got the new, new Odyssey. Wow. But she hates my car and constantly begs me to buy a new car, something in the thirty to 40000 range. My fear is she is already driving a luxury vehicle, and I do not want to jeopardize our financial goals by purchasing another ostentatious, ostentatious vehicle. I was going to say something else, but thank you for that. <laughs> sure. My Taurus has some dents and rough interior, but it runs good. Although, I'd be lying if I said I didn't wish the air conditioner worked on hot days. Please explain to her that fancy vehicles destroy wealth building. That was in red. I shouldn't have read that out loud. No, you should have. <laughs> I, right. I was just pointing out things that, you Okay. Know. Yeah. Uh, we will live long enough to reach our goal. Will, will we live? Will we live long enough to reach our goal of $5 million of net worth? Thanks. Not if you replace that Taurus. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, the Taurus is badass. Right? I'd, I'd keep pimping the Taurus. The Honda Odyssey, you know, that's where you go on date night, you know, and if you're just cruising to work and back, you know, I don't know. I don't see anything wrong with that. But if you want to buy a new car, I don't think you would jeopardize your overall situation. Because, Alan, why don't you solve for N for me, please? Yeah, that's what I'm okay? doing. Okay? Yeah. So do this. We All right. So let's go 56, um, 60,000 plus if he saves the annuities, that's another 45. So $65,000 a year. So let's say he okay. cashes in the annuity. Those annuity payments come in for, oh, but you're going to have to do a little bit tricky math there because yeah, they no. only come in for 2026. Okay, agreed. All right. And then he's going to save into. But even even 65 is with two 401ks plus Roth. So that's about right anyway. So I'm saying $65,000 of savings per year. I'm saying how long does it take to get $5 million if you start with $1.2 million? I'll use I'll I'll use the seven percent. I'll start there since that's what I did before. Okay, and, and I get uh, I get I get fifteen years. Fifteen years. All yeah. right. Now if I do eight percent instead of seven percent because he's all in the stock market, now it's fourteen years. All right. But you, but what that's not net worth though because you're not you're just including liquid assets. You're not including his home of six fifty. That's true. So yep. you're, 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 you'll get there probably 12 years, buddy. Yeah, if we're going just net worth, but I was trying to go with spendable. Actually, the, the better question to ask yourself is how much income do I want in retirement and then work backwards with that 4% rule that we just talked about. So if you want to spend $200,000 per year in retirement and you have no Social Security, let's just make it super simple. So divide two. 200,000 by 4% or the same math multiply that by 25 200,000 times 25 you get 5 million yep. right so that's that's but, but Paul's man he's a simple guy he's chilling in the Taurus yeah. making 120,000 dollars combined he's what he's 50 years old Probably uh, drinking some uh, Keystone Lights there in South Carolina. What, yeah, are, what so, do they drink out there? I have no idea. I don't so, know. It's probably so, something good. But something another delicious. way to say this is, is so let's just say Paul you want to spend 150. Let's just do Are we going to go 17 minutes on this segment? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, for, just for one second. And let's <laughs> say your Social Security is is 30. So you, you actually need 120. We divide that by 0. 0.04. So what you really need is 3 million of liquid assets. And then you can get there a lot more quickly. All right. Right. It's nine years instead of 14. Good work, Paul. Uh, congratulations. Um, dude, you got to get a life, though. You just found us and you already caught up on 28. Come on. Get out there. Watch that four tours. Maybe buy a new car. I don't know. Yeah, I would buy a, a new used car. Big Al, it's got the big bucks though. <laughs> I just bought my son a car from Hertz Car Rental. It was a uh, Sentra. It had seventy thousand miles, but it looked brand new. It would cost under eight thousand. Yeah, and right. your son's forty-five. <laughs> yeah, he's 60, 64. Yeah. <laughs> There go Paul and his wife riding into a comfortable retirement in their Taurus or their Odyssey or their Sentra. How about you? Is retirement just up the road for you as well? Check out this week's episode of the Your Money, Your Wealth TV show for a 365-day countdown to retirement to see if you're financially ready to retire. I've linked to it in the show notes along with the free download of Big Al's Quick Retirement Calculator Guide 
to help you see if you're on track. Click the link in today's episode description in your podcast app and watch and download now. Or, you know, when you're done listening to this podcast. The point is, we've got you covered. Moving on now to more of your money questions. (laughs) All right. So Jason from... He didn't tell us. Jason, there's rules to your money or wealth. If you want a question answered, you need to state where you're from. Can monthly annuity payments from an IRA annuity be used for QCDs? Ah. Well, let's explain what a QCD is. A qualified charitable uh, distribution. So this is when you're over 70 and a half. You actually can designate some of your required minimum distribution or even all of it. You designate it to go directly to charity. And so here's the caveat is the check from your IRA or the distribution has to go directly to charity. It cannot be made out in your name and then you give it back to the charitable organization because that's a full distribution and then you get to take the charitable deduction. There's a lot of reasons you might want to do a QCD because your adjusted gross income is lower. You may not be able to itemize your deductions anyway. And so in a lot of cases, folks that do QCDs will end up paying less tax. Not in all cases, but in many cases. Well, with the new tax law, it... It, some people might not be able to deduct a charitable contribution anymore. Yeah, that's the problem. So a single taxpayer, it's, it's around $12,000, your standard deduction. And maybe you don't have enough deductions to, to, to count at 12. So, so in other words, if you take the required minimum distribution and pay tax on it and then give it to charity, we well, didn't even itemize anyway, so you didn't get a tax deduction. That, that's, the, that's kind of the big change with the new tax law, the standard deduction being so much higher. So a lot of folks are going to benefit more from these QCDs. But the question is, can monthly annuity payments from an IRA annuity be used for QCDs? I'm going to say no. And the, my reasoning is this, that depending upon how it's structured, I guess, but if the annuity payment is coming out each month to you in your name, then it's a distribution. Maybe if somehow in the IRA you can, the annuity payment just stays in the IRA, I suppose you could do that potentially and then have a QCD go directly. I don't think so. Because I, I'm guessing he already annuitized yeah. Right, the contract? Yeah, that's what I'm thinking, too. That's that's why I think it, it's probably not very likely, because the checks are already coming to him. So I guess to take a step back, Jason purchased an annuity, it sounds like. And there's different investments that you can purchase inside an IRA or individual retirement account. So he retired, and maybe he already had the annuity in the IRA, or maybe he rolled his 401k into an IRA, and then he purchased the annuity Um, And with an annuity, there's tax-deferred annuities or there's immediate annuities. uh, There's variable annuities. We've talked all about annuities on this program in the past. But there's certain circumstances where individuals will say, you know what, I'm done with investing. I just want to get a guaranteed income stream. And so you can annuitize the contract. And what that does is you tell the insurance company to say, you know what, what is the amount of money that you will give me monthly for the rest of my life? Given right. whatever lump sum that Jason had. Sure. And so they're going to calculate and they'll say, well, here's the payment that we will continue to pay you forever. So that payment is either based on Jason's life expectancy or a period certain or something like that. And that's and he's the owner and the annuitant. Yeah. And, so, and generally, so then that would come out to him in a monthly check or whatever. Right. And it's in his name. His name. So you couldn't say send it to charity. Right, because the charity's not the annuitant. Right. He's yeah. the, the annuitant. The only thing I was thinking is if you had an annuity inside an IRA and the payments went to the IRA, I don't know if you can even do that. Yeah, I don't think so. Maybe if he didn't annuitize the contract, because people get confused with terms all the time sure. too. right. So maybe he purchased an annuity and he's just taking income from it. He's just taking s- s- standard distributions from it. Uh, then yes, you would be able to do a QCD if you're just taking distributions because it's not annuitized. Yeah, if you have the option, right? So then, then you could have a distribution go directly to Right, charity. you could just say, all right, well, here, let's say MetLife, the annuity, yeah. right? But tip- Send 50000 to this charity. Yeah, but typically when we think of annuitization, then that means a payment stream right. to the annuitant. Yes, this is this sounds to me, I mean, it's, it's one sentence. Yes. So. 
we're we're guessing on a bunch of stuff here, Jason, just to make sure that we give you the p- appropriate <laughs> answers here. We don't I, mess around. I think we nailed it. Yeah, we're very thorough. Okay, hopefully that helps. Tom from Colorado. He goes, what happens if someone makes a mistake with an IRA that leads to penalties? Tom, well, you should listen to Your Money or Wealth. <laughs> Tom is a big listener of YMOW. How do they get caught if they don't self-report? Oh, well, you want to break the law now, Tommy? Is there a statue of limitations? About the podcast, Tom said, I think you guys are better as a team than either are individually. And I like the outtakes. Andy's participation makes the show more interesting. So that means we suck individually. <laughs> We're awful. But so- somehow when it comes together. <laughs> I don't... <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Jesus. Yeah, we're awful individually. <laughs> I couldn't imagine a yeah. show with... Actually, I could not imagine a show with just me. You'd fall asleep. And with you, I don't know what... You'd, you'd drive off the road. <laughs> just so so I, I guess I agree with Tom. Scattered brain. Just <laughs> yelling at just stupid stuff. <laughs> you wouldn't be happy. You'd be, you'd yes, be angry. I'd be, yes, I'd be angry. Yeah. Um, okay, so Tom blew up his IRA. He's got some penalties. And then how'd he get caught? <laughs> well, that's a great question. So, 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 how could you make a mistake with an IRA? Well, you could forget to do a required minimum distribution, or you could make a contribution if, even if you weren't allowed to. Like, let's say you had no earned income, or maybe you're over seventy and a half and you do a contribution to an IRA. You're not allowed to do that, or, or too much income may- and goes into a Roth. Yeah, or maybe yeah, maybe you put ten thousand in a into an IRA contribution and you're under fifty and you can only do six thousand. I mean, there's lots of ways you can. <laughs> mess it up. And so the IRS says, you know what, if you if you undo it generally by October 15th of the following year, you you don't get penalized. But then in a lot of cases that date's already passed when people realize they made a mistake. That is what he's asking, and is there a statute of correct. limitations? <laughs> and and then in that case what you're supposed to do is then report it on your on your next year's tax return and pay an excise tax of Six percent per year is as many years that the I- Air, excess, yeah. excess IRA is in there. Or if you forgot to take a required minimum distribution, it's you, a fifty percent fifty fifty percent penalty. So um, how do you get caught if you don't self-report? It's a, a, upon audit or yeah. the fifty-eight ninety-four. Yeah, it's uh, I I will say fifty-four ninety-eight. Yeah, fifty-four ninety-eight. I I will say the IRS is. Uh, does check these things, but in all honesty, just being honest, they don't have a ton of resources to go after everybody. So could you get away with it? Yeah, you could. Likelihood, yeah. Yeah. You pr- <laughs> I didn't say that. You did. <laughs> it's, uh, however, th- there is a statute of limitations. It's three years after you file. It's, if if uh, Tom's in Colorado, I know in California it's four years after you file. So And if they catch you, then... Yeah, you're gonna you're gonna pay whatever tax is on the mistake. You're gonna pay whatever penalties, and they'll probably slap on some other penalties just for doing it wrong. Yeah. So I, I think Tom, what what mistake happened? I think <laughs> that would, it would be, be a, first of all a lot better radio. Well, he's probably asking for a friend. <laughs> yeah. He says that hey, leads when, to penalties. So. I, I, uh, my I, have this, I have this friend, this neighbor that might have. Uh... Yeah, I was telling him about your podcast and how great you guys are together and how bad you suck individually. <laughs> <laughs> and Andy just puts everything together without her. The whole thing would be a yeah. piece of garbage. Yeah. Yeah. And anyway, we're having a couple beers. Yeah. <laughs> And, and so he comes up and says, hey, I mean, I wonder if you could call in for me. <laughs> <laughs> I got this mistake. Yeah, that's, that's right. So what the hell did you do? Come on, Tom. Spill the beans. Did you make an excise contribution? I mean, we see this every single day. It's like, okay, well, you make $300,000 a year. How long have you been saving into the Roth? Well, every year since it came out. Well, how long have you been making three hundred grand? Well, I don't know, for the past 20 years. Okay, well, you've been making... <laughs> Excise contributions into a Roth for the last twenty years, you know. Yeah. Is now, that the most common mistake that you guys see? No, they're all kind of common. Yeah. I think like people taking distributions out of retirement accounts and not understanding the amount of tax is probably the biggest mistake that we yeah, see. Yeah, but he's specifically asking about something that leads to penalties. Well, so, if you excise, yeah, if yeah. you don't take an RMD, um, yeah, I would say those are the two probably most common. Yeah, and, I, and those have a. 
a three-year statute of limitations. There's one that probably has no statute of limitations, which to me is more risky, obviously, and that's if you make a Roth contribution and you weren't allowed to, 20, 30 years later, that whole account could blow up because of that. Right. And they'd say, no, you didn't. none of this. It was and disallowed. It was disallowed. So all this money that you put in, that comes out tax-free, but all the growth is taxable, and we're going to charge you penalties? Yeah. Six percent each year, each so thirty percent. You're jamming all that money in. Let's say you yeah. got three, four hundred grand in a Roth. So Everything comes out taxable, ordinary income that year plus six percent excise penalty. Yeah, for twenty, on the for country, 20 for years. For twenty some odd six, years. That's sixty percent. Yeah, you wow. blow that whole thing up. Yeah, or hundred, hundred percent, whatever. Yeah. Right. Yeah, 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 whole thing gone. So can that happen? Absolutely. So um, I don't know. Maybe a little bit more juice. Can I can I critique the the questions? <laughs> You already are. <laughs> oh, so I guess I guess the answer is yes. Okay, uh, Andy, wonderful job today. Thank you, Jeff. Big Al, good job. Thank you, sir. You got it. We'll see you guys next week. Chills cut your money well. Big thanks to Big Earn, Karsten Yeska, PhD, CFA from EarlyRetirementNow.com. Keep listening for the derails at the end of this episode to hear what Joe is planning for Big Earn before we set Joe on the right track. Read the transcript of that interview and check out all of the free financial resources mentioned just by clicking the link in the description for today's episode in your podcast app. Thanks also to everyone who told us how much they love the show in the podcast survey and as well, thanks to those who gave us constructive criticism. We appreciate it all, honestly. I, we do, really. To help us spread the financial knowledge and the funny, the best thing you can do now is to share your money or wealth. Email a link to the podcast to somebody you know that would get value from it or share an episode on social media and tag YMYW Show on Twitter or Pure Financial Advisors on Facebook. Your Money, Your Wealth is presented by Pure Financial Advisors. For your free two-meeting financial assessment with a certified financial planner, all you have to do is click that free assessment button at yourmoneyyourwealth.com. Pure Financial Advisors is a registered investment advisor. This show does not intend to provide personalized investment advice through this broadcast and does not represent that the securities or services discussed are suitable for any investor. Investors are advised not to rely on any information contained in the broadcast in the process of making a full and informed investment decision. Karsten Yeska. Very well done. Oh, my God. That's awesome. <laughs> that's the first one you got right Yeah, I year. thought for sure I was going to blow that <laughs> well, thing up. I, I have to admit, I actually spelled his name so that you would pronounce it correctly. <laughs> Karsten Yeska. Because it's actually that's... spelled J-E-S-K-E. Oh, that would have been so Ooh, yeah. much better. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, that would have been <laughs> awesome. What do you call him? Jasky. Uh, he's also known as Big Earn. What the hell? How do you get Big Earn out of Karsten Yeska? Keep reading. Oh. For the past year and a half... He's been studying the hard data on this topic and sharing it on his blog, Early Retirement Now. Earn. Earn. Oh, is his nickname. Get it? <laughs> and he's six foot six inches tall, so he's Big Earn. Big, big Earn. Big, earn. big Al. And he's going like to be talking about safe withdrawal rates for early retirees. So He's got like a 27-part blog series on the topic. Well, he's a PhD, CFA, Early Retirement Now. So he's starting a whole new... What, he, he thinks Big Earn's going to take over the fire movement? It kind of has. He is like the guy that has got the, all of the real hard data on early retirement withdrawal but, but, rates. What's the hard data? So I, he's the he's Wade Fowl of, of... He's done case studies. He's got a work. He's Michael Kitchis of... Basically, of, yeah. I don't think so. Wait until you talk to him. Big Earn. Yeah, don't make any judgments yet. All right. He might be just the guy. Karsten Neska. PhD CFA will battle it out with Big Al <laughs> at the Battle Royal. Um, you'll love that one. I can't wait for that. Yeah. So hey, um, if you guys got money questions, you know where to find us. Go to yourmoneywealth.com. Ask Joe and Al on the air. Uh, we're also starting a new segment called Complaints and Compliments. Compliments um, and Complaints. That's what you said. Compliments and Complaints yeah. or Complaints and Compliments, whatever you want to do. C squared. All you get is compliments, we and actually, all I get is complaints. We actually did get one that said, this is quickly becoming my favorite podcast. I like the style, so don't tone it down or change. Oh, yeah. So you okay. basically keep everything exactly the way it is. All right. Well, I'm going to fight Carson Yeska. <laughs> kick his ass. <laughs> That's what people like. Let's give them what they want. Because there's only one big. It's Big Al. <laughs> you know, when I... Uh, it, it seems like almost every city I go into, there's a Big Al somewhere. Yeah. Do you take your picture next to it every I, time? I you have. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I have. It's, usually they sell hamburgers. <laughs> That's what usually it is. <laughs>